much of our growth has come about as a result of um, mergers and acquisitions. So when you think about that, uh, how do you take those businesses and bring them into our culture and, without uh, having a train wreck? And so the way you do that is you make doggone sure to the extent that you can that the culture of the, uh, of the merged partner is going to be similar to uh, our culture and integrity's got to be number one. And so then you go into a lot of other stuff before you really get into all of the um, checking uh, and documentation that we have to have to determine about the financial piece, which is ultimately very, very important. So over a period of time, if you uh, start um, thinking about what our culture was originally, it has expanded from that very small base, and I mentioned the iconic sign of uh, Ronald Reagan. We have other signs. We have uh, our corporate animal, and the corporate animal is a cheetah, and so it's the fastest uh, land animal uh, in the world, and um, so we think we're very quick to solve people's problems. And Linda Downs, who uh, came with Brown and Brown in 1980 and ultimately rose to be the executive vice president of Brown and Brown, uh, called me, uh, and she's now retired uh, and living a really fine life. Um, as she called me one day and says, I've got, this is 1985, 86, I've got something I want to send you because I think it fits. And so I said, okay, were well, you going to tell me? Everybody says, no, I'm going to send it to you. So she sent me a page out of a magazine and it showed a cheetah. And um, there was a little um, um, missive uh, underneath the cheetah, and it says, every day in Africa, a cheetah awakes, knowing that it must run faster than the slowest gazelle, or it will starve. Every day in Africa, a gazelle awakes, knowing it will have to run faster than the fastest cheetah, or it will die. In the morning, be a cheetah or gazelle, you better be running. And so that's kind of energizing, isn't it? Yeah. And so the reason for that is Linda Downs. And so um, I could go in and show you and talk about all kinds of other pieces, parts of our culture that bring us together. Now, we do have one other thing that's very unusual. We feel that we must bring together uh, the leadership of our company once a year. And we started this in 1967, and there were seven people. Um, and so we now, and we were unable to do it this last year in March because of the coronavirus, um, but we have an annual sales conclave, and it's generally 22, 2,300 people, and it includes all the senior people, all the leaders, all the salespeople, all the people that make our company hum, and their spouses. Spouses are very, very important, be they male or female, because they need to know why Sally or Bill aren't coming home until seven or eight o'clock in the evening because of things we have to do to take care of our customers and clients. And so in that meeting, it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and everybody goes home on Sunday, we're, we're, re we're recognizing accomplishments. And the, uh, the people who hit the top levels uh, their names are on bronze, a bronze plaque, a growing bronze plaque in the home office in Daytona Beach as to the year that they won that award and their record as a result of getting that award. So all this recognition, people want to be recognized for accomplishment. Tell me about your thoughts on the importance of culture when there are bumps in the life of an organization. We're sitting here talking in the middle of a pandemic, and I think a lot of organizations are, are feeling the shock of the change. Um, <clears throat> tell me about your thoughts about the importance of culture to get an organization successfully through the inevitable ups and downs of economies, pandemics, uh, leadership changes, those kinds of things that happen in the lives of organizations? Well, first of all, um, uh, it is common knowledge in Brown & Brown that we're a company that is built to last. We're not a company that is built to flip. 
and uh, I think everybody is aware of private equity. Private equity, um, there are a number of large private equity roll-ups in the insurance brokerage business. And what will happen is, is that the initial investors want to uh, get a five-time return on their money, and it takes about five years. And so they'll flip them, and then somebody else comes along and keeps the uh, pace up, and uh, so then it's flipped again. And so how does that affect the people in the company? Does it make them want to be part of a cohesive organization? You'd have to ask them uh, that question. Uh, we don't have to answer that question because we're not one of those. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, but, but, in order to be a company that's built to last, you gotta be a, a company that is successful. And so we have been, um, and there, uh, the, we have some, have had some ups and downs. We've never had, in the history of our company, a losing year. But we've had some years when the stock has gone down because of the market conditions mm -hmm. uh, or what have you. And so um, we have about um, uh, five, a little over, somewhere between five and 6,000 of our teammates are shareholders because we have a program that allows them to buy stock at 15% discount, which is a pretty doggone good deal. And so we have to think about them. We have to, uh, and so when I would go uh, and, and I used to travel, I was on the road five, six days a week in offices, and the very first thing that the, reception was, the receptionist would ask me when I'd go into the office, why is the stock down this week? And I'd say, well, I damn if I know, did you work hard this week? And so she would say yes, and so you know, I'd say, well, it'll probably go up next week. So you know, there's all this little banter that goes on, but if you're a company that is built to last, and people who uh, understand the culture, they know that it's not gonna be this, mm -hmm. it's gonna be right. this right. and this up and up and up. Right. And so that works. And so if you're in a business that is people, and anybody that's in, if it's academia, if it is uh, police work, if it is a legislator, if it is selling sofas, you gotta relate to people. And a, and a machine's never gonna take that over. And so the, the more that you can relate to people uh, and, the, and, and understand people, the more they're gonna relate to you. So um, uh, that's why a more broad-based um, uh, education, uh, and of course at the time, I thought I knew all about everything. And so um, that's why I just did this and I knew what I was gonna do. Un unlike most people, I knew I was gonna be in the insurance business from the time I graduated from high school. So, uh, but going now, so that's what I would do different. I would get a broader education. Well, that's, you know, music to our ears here because Belmont is a very strong I liberal know. arts yeah. campus and uh, that's, a, that's foundational to what yep. we do. And one of the things that we're having a conversation about in the uh, College of Business now, uh -huh. the Jack C. Massey College, is how to better connect what we're teaching on the business side to that liberal arts side and, and so that those are integrated right. and not separate from each other. I, I totally agree with you.